Okay, good morning, everybody. Oh, we have no, we have no screen. There we go. Reset. <laughs> uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Linux Fest 2024. Uh, it is Saturday. It's the first two days of the actual talks. I'm really glad you all can be joining me. Um, my name is Bry Hatch. Uh, I am a founding engineer at DropZone AI, a startup that started about a year ago. Uh, we're all down in Seattle, mostly, and then a bunch of people scattered around the world. Um, we're a very Python and AI heavy shop. Um, and I'm gonna talk here about Python. None of this is gonna be talking about my work stuff. Um, I personally have been using Python for about 15 years, uh, pretty exclusively uh, from programming languages. Mind you, I always write quick shell scripts. I still have a whole bunch of my home directory written in Perl, and I feel ashamed of that. Um, my home directory's got code going back to the early 90s. Uh, it started off in you know, RCS, and then CVS, and then SVN, and then this new thing called Git. And I've got legacy crud from going all the way back. Uh, but Python has been really the, the scripting language uh, that I've been using um, pretty exclusively. Uh, and trying to avoid mixing and matching too much. Um, my history with Python, um, when I was at my previous job, uh, I started off and I had a quote starter project. Uh, that starter project was uh, build us the licensing for our product, we don't know what it needs to look like. Um, and we knew we wanted to pull data from different systems, it was gonna grab that information, it was gonna create licensing data, it was gonna then put that in different databases, it was gonna have a serving component where it could serve it in real time off to systems via HTTP and other nasty bastardization of protocols that we will not go into, including Google protobufs. Um, and then there would be a reporting component that takes that data in and provides metrics and puts it into other databases. And I said, I think before I write a single line of Python, I should learn how to do unit tests. Because I want to make sure, as I iterate, as I go, what I think worked before still works now. I was a little paranoid about trying in my you know, first foray of a language, something that's going to end up being thousands and thousands and thousands of lines of code running in separate different data centers that are going to be hooked through various different mechanisms. And like, how can I really know it works if I just have a little script on a piece of paper say, try this, run this, compare the output. So that's why I started unit tests first when I started in Python. So we're gonna use a couple of examples here uh, for our unit testing. There's a thing that I would call min coins. Uh, this is gonna be a function. It's gonna figure out the minimum number of coins that you can use to create a total amount of currency. So you might say I've got five nickels, two pennies, and a dollar. And the total I'm looking for is this. So this is overall what the, uh, the mint coins looks like. Some target value, like $1.27. And then a list of coins. Maybe it's you know, five, two, and one. This could be one of the examples we use. So a five cent piece, a two cent piece, and a one cent piece. The output of this thing should be a dictionary of how many coins of each type you need to get that target value and it should be the minimum number of coins. So if I said I want $1.20 and I had as an option a penny, I could do 120 pennies. But if I also had a dollar coin, then that would obviously be not the minimal number of coins. So this tool should try to do, quote, the right thing to figure out what is the minimum number of coins out of that. So four coins in coins, do something, hand wavy, hand wavy, and then return that dictionary. So this is the thing we're gonna test a lot. So let's say I've got the code written. This, honestly, when I was first learning Python, is how I would say, uh, let me see if it worked. So I pull up IPython, which is just a command line uh, Python tool. I import the min coins uh, function from the my code file. And I'm gonna say min coins, paren, 121, that's the target value, $1.21. And I give it a list of coins. Apparently I've got a five cent coin, a two cent coin, and a one cent coin available. It comes back and it says you want 24 of the five cent coins and one of the one cent coins. If we do the math, that equals 121. So this is just Bry at a command line, sanity checking, does it look right? And then maybe I play around with coins on my desk for a while to make sure I got it right. 
this is very not automated. This is really no better than putting a bunch of print statements in my code. So let's, let's go, let's evolve. Let's go to the print statement version. Uh, we're the last line, four lines of my code. Uh, let's test out that same thing, 121 with five, two, and one coins, and print out that the answer, bri, should be five, 24 of those, one, one of those. And uh, for 24, let's say, okay, the output if we're doing seven and three cent coins, then you should have three of the seven cent coins and one of the three cent coins. And then if I try to say, how do I get 25 cents using four and twos? The answer is none, it cannot work. You cannot, unless you chop something in half, get to 25 cents. So here's my sanity check. I run my code and it says, this is the actual result I got and here is the result I expected. And me, the human, the QA analyst, somebody, should remember periodically through development to rerun this and double check with their eyeballs. And eyeballs are fallible and remembering to do something often doesn't happen, but it's, it's better than nothing, right? So this is the slow way we get there. Let's see if we could do it just a little bit better. So in this case, we're gonna use the unit test module. This is built in a Python, so import unit test. The unit testing model is, or module is allowing you to make tests in small little chunks. You decide what things you wanna test, you say here's some inputs and here's some expected outputs, or here is a thing I run and a behavior I expect. And you can make one, two, a million tests. You can do whatever you need in there, and it's gonna take care of the you know, sanity checking so it can look, does the value I expect match the value I got? We take the eyeballs out of the equation. So there's a little bit of boilerplate here. Uh, we got our Python 3 line, we do our import. Um, we then are gonna pull in that min coins function, so the same thing we had in IPython, from my code, must be in the same directory, import min coins. So now we have the min coins function. I haven't done anything with it, but we have it. This first line of boilerplate here uh, is defining a class. Uh, for those of you who have not done object-oriented programming in Python, unit tests do use it, but you don't have to know much about it. Um, but we do put all these things in a single test class or multiple test classes. Those test classes inherit from a thing called unit test dot test case. This brings in a bunch of just black magic, so you don't need to worry about it. Inside these test classes, you make one or more methods. So this method is called test min coin one. I'm gonna do coin one, coin two, coin three, coin four. I'm gonna make a bunch of tests. So this is the first one. There is one part of that black magic. Anything that starts with test underscore is a unit test. This is going to be magically, later on, executed and run and part of the unit test framework. So naming is important here. Has to start with test underscore if you consider it a test. Uh, it takes an object self, just like every other OO thing does. I'm going to just focus right here on this little line we'll work our way back out. We've got the line min coins, that's running our min coins function. Uh, it takes arguments 121, that's the number of coins <coughs> to target. Uh, by the way, all these are going to be online later on, so if you want to you know, take a look at this later on, I believe we'll have both the videos online and the presentation will be online um, as soon as I hit enter at the end of the day. Um, so you don't need to take notes unless you want to. So min coins, 121, and then the list of coins, five piece, two piece, one piece. This should output a, or sorry, should return a dictionary. We are gonna use the thing called asserts equal, which is a, object, or a method on side this self object. Assert equal takes two things, one value and another value and it asserts that they are equal. It makes sure that they are the same value. So min coins is gonna return a dictionary. The second argument to assert equal is the dictionary that has the value that is expected. So we're saying, dear unit test framework, run min coins, compare that dictionary output to this dictionary output. This is the one that we know is pristine, it is right, we've verified it's good, and you should now see if that is true. The last little bit of boilerplate, you probably see this you know, if name equals main thing a lot. Um, instead of calling a you know, main function or you know, something else, we call the unit test.main. This 
means that unit test now looks at all of my code in this class, runs all of those test underscore methods, and tries to see if things are good or not. The output is kind of minimal. So we're running our test, you know, dot slash tests. Uh, we have in the output here a single dot on a line. We have a big, long horizontal line. Uh, ran test in how many seconds and OK. OK means good. Uh, just for the fun of it, you can tell if you do echo dollar question mark, the value zero appears. Who knows what that variable is? It's the return code. Is zero good or bad? Good. Zero means success. What means not success? Anything that isn't one, or anything that isn't zero. Zero success, there's only one way to be successful. Any other value is not success. So this means that the test pass, uh, if you're running a pipeline, you know, do this, and if it doesn't work, then do something else. You can use this exit status properly. Um, the reason that there's one single dot here is it ran one test. We had a test called test min coin one. If you had 20 tests, you'd have 20 dots if everything was good. Or you might have three dots, a big F for fail, two more dots, a big F for fail, and it'll show you how many things succeeded and which ones didn't. If you want more details, which when things are going badly you do, you can use minus V, and then it'll actually show you when it runs things one by one by one and what their exits were. So test min coin one uh, tells you that it came from the tests class inside main and that that was okay. And again, if we had 20 things, then each one would say okay, pass, fail. And it might even show you if it fails, what the problems were that it saw. Any questions up to this point? All right. So now that we've seen something concrete, let's talk about, about strategies and basics and best practices. Um, when I was saying how my first, my starter project was gonna be mission critical uh, licensing for the entire you know, company product fleet, um, I didn't write it and then say, now I should write some tests, right? I went very slowly. I iterated, I wrote small testable chunks. There was one thing to grab information from a database. And so I said, well, let me write that and let me write a test that when I get the data, I process it right. Let me pretend I get data that's good. Let me pretend I get data that's bad. Let me make sure that it's actually providing the exceptions when the data is bad. If I'm looking for a name field and I don't find one, I should do something about that. So iterate slowly, but iterate as you go. Don't try to do it two years later. After the fact, it gets really, really hard. Um, make many test cases. Don't say, I'm gonna test the happy path. If I get data, it says good, great. What about bad data? What about missing data? What about data in a completely different form? I'm expecting JSON, and they gave me a string. Right? The more test cases you provide, the quicker you'll be able to find out when something is broken. Uh, especially, let's say you've got a code base that you've run in, and somebody makes a new change for a new thing, and they've actually expected a new version uh, from you know, the third argument. It should be a dictionary instead of a string. And they've gone through all of the rest of the things that call that same code, and they've made that third argument take a dictionary and accept a string, but they missed one. Unit tests will catch that. If you've got them all instrumented and have them actually check what their arguments look like, your unit tests will catch that there was one out of 500 places that this, you know, this method change was missed. So many test cases, good. Um, make testable chunks. Don't try to test the thing that pulls down the database, fabricates the widget, you know, launches the space shuttle, blah, blah, blah. Break them into smaller pieces. Um, this is good programming practice anyway. It's better to have small methods that do one thing or maybe two things or very highly related things, but not a bunch of stuff. Reading a database and doing something with it, probably fine. Reading a database, doing something with it, launching a space shuttle, going and getting lunch, that's, that's too much. Break into smaller pieces. That also means you can now unit test them properly. Don't create side effects. Um, you'll find later on, and certainly you may have very complicated things. Um, if you are doing things more than just you know, computation, you know, magic inside there, your side effects can cause problems with unit testing. For example, let's say, uh, I've got a thing that's gonna print out debugging lines. Uh, that is gonna come through, all those prints are gonna come out in my unit tests, and they're gonna essentially 
make noise. It's gonna make it harder for me to see what I'm doing. So maybe separate your output from the things you compute. Um, maybe you want to go and grab data from a database and then do something on it. You might actually want to make grab from database and do something with it as separate testable things. That especially comes in later, as you'll see, when we try to mock out things. In real time, when we're doing a unit test, you don't necessarily have access to the production database. And you shouldn't have access to the production database. So maybe you have a local test database, or, as we'll see, you make a fake database. And so you're going to, instead of having real database transactions happen, you're going to be mocking in a fake database that returns the fake data you're looking for. But if everything's in one big module or method, you can't do that so easily. So avoid side effects, try to keep things module. Uh, don't do anything dangerous. So if you're you know, finding a list of files to delete, and then maybe have a separate thing that deletes the files, and you test the thing that gets the files to delete, and you don't actually delete the files in your unit test, especially if those files are, say, your source code. So don't do anything dangerous in your things that are testing. Break those into separate pieces. Uh, use test data. Again, don't rely on the database. It might not be up and available. Don't rely on my local user ID being 1,000 on this machine and 1,002 on a different machine. Don't rely on particular individuals being around. Don't rely on anything that is not going to be you know, reflected inside both the place where I run the unit tests in my desktop, where I run the unit tests in my CI CD pipeline, where other things might run in production. Try to keep out any of those weird local dependencies by using local test data as opposed to relying on system things. Uh, and the last one, mock. Who, who knows what mock means in the, in the unit testing language? So I see a couple of hands, that's great. Um, sometimes you don't want to rely on the real database or the real system time or the real this. You can actually mock things out, and we'll, we have examples later on, where you pretend to be the file on disk. You pretend to be the output of the program. You pretend to be the database. And you can give it the data that you want to test on without needing to spin up a Postgres database. Okay, so in the unit testing world, um, we would talk about you know, success and failure. Uh, so let's quickly define what does it mean to fail a unit test test case. It fails if it throws an exception. That's, that's it right there. So if you've got code that is doing some tests, does A equal B, you know, does this string appear in that string, the way you signify to unit test that it failed is by throwing an exception. What exception? Doesn't matter. You have to throw something. So throw a runtime error. Um, throw you know, OS error if you pretend to open a file. Doesn't really matter. Um, but failure means you threw an exception of some kind. We do most of this f on your own by using the built-in cases that they already have. So there are a number of things that you can use to not worry about manually throwing. So for example, the first one we saw was assert equal. So if you say self dot assert equal paren and give it two things, it's gonna say, are these two things equal? It will itself raise an exception if they are not. And it does a really nice job of figuring out what equal means. So if I have two dictionaries, you know, let's say I have hello world as one key pair and good night moon as another key pair. I might create them hello world, good night moon. But the dictionary with good night moon and hello world, they're, they're the same thing. They still have the same values. So it's going to be smart enough to check that and, and realize that they're OK. If you have a highly nested dictionary, it's going to walk the tree all the way down. As long as all the key value pairs are there, and regardless of order, as long as the lists are there, you know, attached to the key pairs, but the lists have to be in the right list order, like as long as the thing looks right to you, it's going to do the work for you. You do not need to build your whole, you know, deep copy tree logic. So assert equal, does this probably output match this expected stuff that we are looking for? Assert not equal is the exact opposite of that. You know, make sure that these are not assert true, assert false. Maybe one of my methods I call, all it does is returns true or false. Like, is user authorized? Is user not authorized? So maybe I'm just gonna check the true or false. Uh, assert in, assert not in, assert that, you know, in this list, in this set, in this whatever iterable I have, that this value is there, or is it not in? Um, there are a bunch more than just this, but these are the most commonly used ones. Um, also, there's is none, is, is not none. Uh, for saying, you know, is this value specifically none? Not just false, but none. 
So none is a specific version of false. Zero is a specific version of false, but both of those are distinct. Here are some more powerful yet common things you can use to test. Um, there's assert raises. So maybe I want to call a method or a function, and I expect, given the parameters I send it, that it's actually going to raise an exception. Maybe I say go and curl a website that is not around. Maybe I say divide by zero, and I want to make sure that it returns some sort of exception. You can run that code, say it's going to make an exception. The very first argument you put in there is the exception you expect. So you could say division by zero error, or key error, value error. So what is the specific exception I expect to get when my function is called? Here's one important thing to note. The remaining arguments, we do not call the function in here. We give it the function itself that it will call. We give it the parameter or parameters that it's going to take that function. Do not put func param. That would run the function. We don't run the function. We let the assert raises run the function itself. So you, in our case, you say min coins, not min coins param. So min coins, comma, 121, comma, some list of, of uh, coins that we're going to use. And if that exception is raised, then all is well with the world. And if it doesn't, then this will actually throw a unit test error saying that the exception wasn't raised, and you can go and do a backtrace. Uh, another variant of that is the same thing where we're looking for a specific exception, um, but we're going to do a regex match on what that exception says. So let's say we want to be looking for not just key error, you know, some key was missing. We want to make sure that inside that error message, key error foo not found in blah. So you might do a regular expression to say foo not found. Because if there are five other key errors, those, those are OK. It's the foo not found in blah that we care about. So you can get pretty granular here. Uh, the last one that is a little bit weirder syntax, uh, if you're not familiar with a, a context, you can do log-based assertions. So who's, who's used logging before? Logging is good. Use the standard logging module whenever you can. Um, you can say, run this code with a logger. The logger, instead of outputting to my screen, is going to log to this object itself. And then you're going to go looking through that logger to say, did I, in fact, find a specific log line that I'm looking for? The way that this one works is with a context manager. So this is this section here. With self, whoops, that's too many selfs. With self.assert logs level info as CM, context manager, run my min coins. Nothing bad happens yet. Runs it, it's got a logger. After that, we use, oh, that's supposed to be self, oh, sorry, yeah, that's right, self assert equal on the context manager output, that's what the logger got. Make sure that error bozo sent us a negative coin value is in the stuff that was logged. So this one requires a context manager. That's that this newfangled with stuff that's only been out for, what, 15 years. Um, but a lot of us are still getting used to using context managers more. So you can go and look at what the log output was. OK, I've thrown a bunch of things at you. Let's actually keep going forward and let's try it out more. Let's flesh out our min coins. Um, I'm going to make three different things, a big endian, a little endian, and an unnecessary check. But we're going to keep checking that same 121. 121 with coins 521, 521, and 125. All of these should have the same results. Here I'm showing that it doesn't matter which of the dictionary orders you put them in. Assert equal is going to do the right thing. So in this case, I start with the 5. In this case, I start with the 1. And then uh, this one the same thing here. The only real effective change is I decided, oh, I'll throw the coins in a different order. Can't be wrong, right? Min coins is smart. We all know what's going to happen right now, right? Min coins wasn't smart. Min coin took the first coin and tried to figure out how many times it could get the first coin, and then it tried the second one, then it tried the third one. But if the first one was one, it could make 121 coins. And it said, yay, I'm done. It didn't do min. It didn't do min at all. It needed to do some sorting or something. So this is what bad looks like. We have three tests, dot, f, dot. The first one succeeded, the next one failed, the third one succeeded. By the way, it might not run them in the same order that the code is written. This is what bad looks like. It actually shows you a stack trace. 
and it shows you a diff. So it says there was an assertion error that this thing does not equal that thing. We had 121 one cent coins. I expected five 24s and one one. Bad programmer, go fix your code. It also shows in a diff output, uh, diff lines, the first, a line starting with a minus means it's from the old thing, and a line with a plus means it's from the new thing. So if you're familiar with diff output, this is another way of essentially saying the assertion error here. Uh, and that echo dollar per question mark now shows one, which means failure. Uh, if you do with minus V, you get a little bit more info. We can now really see here up at the top when it's running which one. So it was, in fact, a fail on the little endian. So if you wanted to make a single test case for every single thing, and you're testing the thing in many different ways, that could be annoying, just like this sound. I'm not touching that. Hopefully we don't hear the hiss coming through. I'll get a spitball so you can get rid of it. So often what you do in order to just conserve space and to make things more readable, you'll say, okay, let's, let's do loops. Let's take a whole bunch of different inputs and outputs. Let's test them all. So this is one example. I might make a test data variable here. It's a list of lists. Each one of these lines is a separate test run we're going to do. The first thing in the line is the test value that we're targeting, so 121 cents. The next thing is the coins we're going to send in. And the last thing is the results we expect to get back. So we're going to take each one of these lists, run them through. So test data one goes into data. We're going to assert equal that min coins, paren, data zero, data one. So run it with the first two arguments, equals data two. So. The one problem with this is when you run it, if it fails, you kind of have to figure out where it failed by looking at which line and data was related back there. What some people will prefer to do instead of having essentially code and data mixed is they'll actually put their data, their test case, into something else. Uh, this is a similar idea of doing it in YAML. So we're going to say, OK, we've got a whole bunch of coin tests. And this is a list of coin tests. The total is 121. The coins we're putting in is that. And here are the expected values. We can do this same exact thing. Looks a little bit different now. So we've got open up that test data. It's called MinCoinsYAML. Um, this little uh, dir name file, this is a way of saying from my current directory, there's a directory called test data. And inside test data is this .yaml file. Let's join those paths together. Um, it is kind of a convention that people, when they're doing test data, put in a directory called test data. So open up the min coins data, load that up, put it into self.test data. Uh, now that it is in YAML, we actually have like names as part of these dictionaries. We're not using bracket zero. We can actually say data bracket, data bracket coins and data bracket expected. Same exact result here as in the previous one. Sometimes you end up getting a lot of boilerplate like that. I'm loading in my external test data. Again, external test data, good. I'm loading it up every time, and I got 25 different tests that are running with this. Uh, how can I minimize my code? Like, you know, don't repeat yourself, DRY principle. There are some special methods called setup and teardown. Setup is run every single time just before it runs a test case. Teardown is run every single time when it's done in the test case. So if you had something you did, you might need to clean it up. I very seldom do teardowns, but if you had cleanup to do, that's where they go. So for me, what I usually do is I'm using that for uh, grabbing a test data once rather than every single different test, or creating specific objects that I'm going to use because I want to re not repeat myself. So let's say we had a test coins and a test dice function. We've got two of these things now. I put all of my test data in one single min coins YAML. I'm going to, in my setup method, open up that file, grab the data, stick it in test data, and I'll use that inside my test coins method. And then I use the dice test data inside my test dice method, and I don't have to copy that each time. So it's a way of you know, doing something every time, shaving yourself some, some, uh, some code there. Next, we're going to get a little uglier. Uh, first of all, any questions while we're here before we move on? Okay, we're going to get uglier. Um, here's our problem to solve. 
uh, HR has this program they gave us uh, that gives us the list of person, start date, and end date. And we want to send them a, a welcome. Like every month we should send them a happy anniversary. You've been here. Like, it's nice, it makes people happy. You hook it up to your mail system, something, who knows. We're gonna publish it in, we're gonna do a mail merge. We're gonna generate some company good feels. Unfortunately, uh, literally we have to run get-hr data. We can't control the output. We can't control how it works. It's some black box. So we wanna write something that goes and emails these folks or says hello on the screen. So we're gonna make a, whoops, that was a little too far in the corner. We're gonna make a say happy anniversary bit of Python. Uh, let's walk through it. Um, actually, let's look at the output first. For now, we're just going to say happy anniversary person name. Happy anniversary person name. We're going to print out the screen. This code works fine. Uh, figure out what the day is today right now. We're going to have to figure out is day in the past, is day in the future, is day the same month. So get the current date. Run subprocess. Subprocess a module. Subprocess run. Runs a program and in this case can capture the output. When it does finish, it gets a variable we call a proc. Proc has a thing called standard out as a method of it, or sorry, an attribute of it, that has the output of that command. It also has things like return code and a bunch of other things, but what we we're gonna want is the standard out part, because that has the output. So this runs, gets the output, uh, converts it to text so we don't have to worry about you know Unicode. We're gonna use a dict reader for a CSV, because it's a CSV file. So this is gonna parse things into CSV format. It's gonna return us rows. We're gonna take that proc.standard out, the output of the script. We're gonna split it into new lines, because that's what dict reader wants. For row in reader, we're gonna read through one of those lines, one by one by one by one. We're gonna find the start date. We're gonna take that string, which is in year, month, day form. We're gonna turn it into an actual date time. Date time is one of the you know, primitives inside Python. And we're gonna say, if the start month is the same as the current month, and the start year is before the current year, so we don't wanna say happy anniversary when you've been here three days, we'll print out happy anniversary. So this works great, this is perfect code, not a flaw. Uh, hello Alice, happy anniversary Alice, Charlie, Evan, etc. Anybody have some initial feelings about what might be hard for unit testing this? Hard, inelegant, any gotchas? Say that a little louder. Running the process. Running this subprocess might not be something I can run in my CI CD pipeline somewhere else. Yeah, that's true. What else we got? A little louder because it's your, making noise. Your, your date might be in a different format than you're expecting. The date might be in a different format. They might not be year, month, day, which is the only valid date format. <laughs> Don't get me started. They might be in a different date format, in which case this, what we call perfect code, could be wrong, which is one of the reasons we'll want to unit test it. What other things might make unit testing hard? All right, let's move on, we'll see. Empty rows in the CSV. What's that? Empty rows in the CSV. I don't know if... Um, empty rows in the CSV. Is smart enough to account for I actually have no idea what we do with empty rows in CSV. The one thing I can see right now is the side effects are bad, and this thing not only gathers data and analyzes it, but it also does output. And we don't want to be having our unit test, hey, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday. So let's just do a little tiny, tiny refactor. Get anniversary people will get the people. So instead of outputting it here, we're going to make a names variable, and we're going to append the names of the people, and we're going to turn that list. And we'll have a separate thing called say happy birthday. And the say happy birthday is responsible for actually saying happy birthday so and so. So break that up. We'll, we'll not even bother testing say happy birthday. We'll just test get anniversary people. Was there a question? So other than that, the code's the same. So let's, let's just try it. Let's just go blindly forward. We're going to make our test. Uh, class tests, test anniversary self, expected. What are the expected people? Uh, based on the CSV that we got right now, it's what we're running. Alice, Charlie, Evan, Charlie, or George, all these people should be showing up. So I've got my list of folks. Uh, assert equal that when I run happy anniversary, get anniversary people, that I get the expected. Um, there's also this nice thing called message you can use if you want. This will show when the test has failed. If you've got 25 things that are just going through a loop, you might want to use a message at that point so you can know which of the 25 things broke. 
So if I run this right now, happy anniversary test, it ran one test in four seconds, it was okay. So it actually works fine. Sweet. How do we know that? How do we know that it worked? So it, it did run happy anniversary people. Thus, it must have, I spake, done the things to do it right because I checked that the output was what was expected. Yeah, but how do we, do, how do we know it still works right? Well, you could run it every day. Yes. As you refactor, you can do it again. So what problems did we miss? Um, what if the HR script gives people in a different order? Right now, it happened to be alphabetical. But what if the output is just random? I gave it a list of things. So maybe I should have sorted it, or I should have done something else to make sure that even if it gives me a different version of that, that it's still good. Uh, we were running subprocess on a program that we might not have in our CI/CD pipeline. We needed to get some fake data to work with instead. Um, the most fun one, we ran it today in April. This won't work in, in seven days. In May, different people are going to be said happy birthday to. So now we've got to do something with the clock. We love clocks. You checked personal information into your source code. Now you have a uh, GAI you, that is an excellent thing. Yes, you should put actual people's PII in your CI CD pipeline or anywhere in the source code. Use fake names. Use my friend Wendell Bag. He's in all of my examples. So, for example, if we take that exact script and we run it with a, this program called Fake Time, Fake Time takes, you know, the first argument is a time that you're going to pretend to be. If I take that exact functional code and say run it on the 1st of May, it says, no, it's all wrong. All these people are getting said hello to. It's actually only, uh, let's see, Diana, whose uh, anniversary is right now. So we're going to have to deal with that. So we're going to not work on dates just yet. Let's just work with a new mock CSV. So let's have a CSV of our own that we can just say it's got fake data. It's not real HR data. We're going to stick that in HR data CSV inside a test data directory. And in our setup, we're going to go and read that in. Cool, now we've got some data to work with. Here's the hard part. Now our code said, subprocess run, run the HR script. How the heck are we gonna sneak around and get our HR data to look like it came from subprocess, even though subprocess is gonna run its thing? Well, this is the magic. We're gonna patch this particular run of the code. We say, in the happy anniversary library, Please patch subprocess. This magic mock does magic. We make a new thing called proc mock. You could have called this foo. We're going to make this you know, proc mock dot standard out be the HR data we wrote. If you remember, we went proc dot standard out dot split lines. We took the result of that proc object and we split it up, and that was the output. We're essentially saying, go ahead and run you know, pretend to run something, but really all you ever do is you return me this fake object, and then I'm gonna set the proc mock as the return value of subprocess.run. So when it tries subprocess.run, it does not call anything. It just makes this new object. This new object has an attribute called standard out. That attribute has the value of our data. So now we know for a fact what we're gonna get every time. And so if I run it today, it's success. If I run it next week, it's success. If I run it three years from now, it's still success because we've hard-coded those people. Um, I lied. It doesn't actually work with the dates yet. Let's fix the dates. Um, you can patch things multiple times. So we did the subprocess one. We can add a update on date time dot now. Here's where I'm going to say, boy, wouldn't it be great if it worked? If you try this, even though you try the exact same pattern, it doesn't because some things are harder to mock than others. Um, date time is essentially a C built-in. You can't do the same tricks on it. Really complex modules and C compiled modules, those can't be mocked using straight mock and magic mock. Um, you can definitely take your time and do lots of machinations to get there. And in fact, the examples page says, here's how you do this one. But it looks different. And having different ways of doing stuff is kind of annoying. What I typically do is I'm finding that most of my code is already OO. I've already got classes with a bunch of methods. So I tend to break my things into smaller methods that do things. So the first example of this 
you know, happy anniversary was just one straight Python script. If we just shift everything a little bit to the right by indentation and put a class around it, we get a lot more options. So let's make a happy anniversary class. Let's make a method called HR data. Its job is to grab the data. Let's make a <coughs> method called now. Its job is to just call date time now. Let's do that exact same code we had for parsing the CSV. You'll note I've got these print statements here. I'm trying to show, yes, in fact, it's running this HR data method. It's running this now method. So when we run it, we see, hi, I'm running now. I'm running HR data. And then it shows, happy anniversary, everybody. The, the last change to this code was instead of having, you know, just calling main at the bottom, we're making a happy anniversary object. So HA equals happy anniversary object. HA dot say happy anniversary run it. Yeah. Oh, um, just letting you know you are running into your question, question and We are logs. almost there. Yeah. Kevin is okay with that as long as you just uh, know because you are incorporating questions already. OK, so our unit test modified to look like this. We have a setup that pulls the file in, just like we had before. We're going to make our happy anniversary object in the setup. We're going to cheat. We are going to say the happy object now method is no longer the one that calls date time. We're going to just call date time here of May 1st. Uh, this lambda says, I'm an anonymous function. And so essentially, we've made a function that will run, and we're associating the now thing that used to exist with just return this date time. So it's always going to be May 1st. And then for grabbing the HR data, instead of actually doing something, we're going to grab the self HR data we just read and split the lines. So those methods will never be called. And when we run it, the test pass. And if I run it last week, next week, two years from now, the test will pass. So we mocked out those things. We essentially said, don't run this. Run this special version of my code that's mocking out. That mock could be data pulled down from curl, from request. It could be data that we you know, sent or received to a, a database. It's all about taking out the unknowns and taking out the nasty and replacing it with something that is good. And change that data. Make it good this time, bad this time. Make sure that it results the way it should. So that is the overview of how unit tests work. It's a lot of stuff I didn't cover. There are many different ways you can do it. You can use talks. You can use PyTest to run a bunch of sets all at once. I just showed you running the test individually. What I would suggest, if you don't know what you're doing, work with what your system already has. Presumably, if you've got like a code base at work, they've already got some way of invoking it. But now you know how to make the pieces. If you don't know, then start small. Just, just work like this, individual tests. Don't forget to run that before you quit. Questions? Way back there. When mocking things like the date in this example, are you not creating edge cases where your test could inadvertently fail or, or succeed when it shouldn't? Like, if I were to then go in as somebody who's not you and add some line that prevents it from running if it's April, your test would no longer catch that because your test is always assuming it's May, right? Your tests. Well, the, the tests are assuming it's May, yes. And if it turns out you do something that requires April, the test will break, which probably is a good thing. Um, but keeping your tests and your code in sync is really a constant struggle. As you iterate, you have to make sure that the test cases you have are still the right ones. As you refactor things further and further, like look at the test cases too. You should be adding tests every time you're adding code or changing it if it's going to make the test valid or invalid. It is not, it is always possible for false positives and false negatives. So it's all about rigor. Um, and that's usually best by having somebody also look at it with you. Yeah? So this looks like it's really good for testing functions and the output of functions. How does it handle an interactive script? Uh, interactive scripts, so Figure out how to make the interactive script programmatically not be interactive. Um, if it's literally somebody typing letters in it, uh, maybe you use the expect module to send it, send it in air quotes, keystrokes. Or maybe you know how it knows to go to the next thing, you can take all of that out to find next key, and then the find next key method that you make is being fed from you. 
And so you have a test where it does one, two, eight, seven, and then it does one, two, eight, nine. So you can actually usually refactor that out fairly well. It takes a little bit of thinking. Um, and one thing I had to do, I had, uh, I had to take a piece of data, I had a you know, base 64 encoded, I had to put it into DNS, I had to send it out to the internet, I had to pull it over here and do the reverse. And I actually managed to glue these server and client processes together through just a light layer, layer of mocks. It, it was, at the end of the day, like three, four lines of code. Um, which took about two days to write, but it worked. And if I changed one little piece, the whole you know, encrypt, decrypt, blah, blah, blah stuff did not work out. And so it was, it was a great test that even without using the network infrastructure it was gonna run on, the piece still worked with all these separate components around ran separate machines and separate environments. But yeah, it looks small and easy. I got it wrong a long time before I got it right. Other questions? Is there generally a balance between like formatting or structuring your code in a way that is optimally efficient and also generally testable or easily testable? I find myself sometimes like breaking up methods that I otherwise wouldn't have just for the sake of being able to test. That is sometimes the case. For example, get the current date if you need date related stuff. Boy, that feels annoying. To have a method that is just doing date time dot now, ugh, why? And you're constantly calling this stupid thing. That that feels bad. But if you try to figure out how to mock it out properly, that's many more lines of code in many other places, and you're probably going to get it wrong ten times out of, out of hundred. And so there is that balance of have I dumbed down my code just for the purpose of unit testing? You're going to have to be the one who decides what that level is that lets you sleep well at night. There are test databases. Like, um, you can find inside Python plenty of examples of you know, starting up a SQL database. And typically, they're like SQLite. But you can have fake interfaces, so it can look like it's Postgres, it can look like it's Oracle, whatever. So you can actually you know, create table, delete table, add table, alter, all that kind of stuff. You can actually do a bunch of mock database stuff. So you can get a real or real enough. And it will start up at the beginning of your test cases, and it kills itself when it's done. So yeah, you don't need to have the test database in the corner of the password. But you might have to like fake the password part. If you're testing, does the password work or not? You don't care about that so much in your tests. Yeah? Can you integrate this with a pipeline? Can it be as simple as calling that batch function? Yeah, you could literally just say dot slash test.py. Yeah. And it returns failure if it didn't work. And typically, your, your test pipelines say, if any program fails, then I stop. That, that is how we have ours. Um, there are lots of cool things. Uh, Pre-commit, pre-commit, is a really useful thing you can do. It does, uh, like you can say, run black, run uh, IO sort, run all these different things. And it will send you bundle up a bunch of different kinds of tests. Some of them are formatting. Some of them are you know, like unit tests. So there are plenty of ways you can do it. You can do talks. Uh, which is one I use anytime I'm building a Python package. Um, but yeah, it's kind of up to you. Um, there's more than one way to do it. Um, use whatever is most similar and available in your existing code base, just for familiarity would be my first suggestion. If you're Greenfield, then try to look at something that's been updated in the last five years, two years, one year, for sure. Don't look at anything that's been built long ago. Uh, it's probably dead code, but we're not good at cleaning up the internet. Last question, anyone? All right, thank you so much for joining. Please.